Southwest Florida's history has taken some unexpected twists through the decades. Sites that remember the region's oddest moments have been preserved as tourist destinations. Thought you knew everything there is to know about your neck of the woods? These three places will inject an element of happy surprise into your day trip or weekend travel agenda. We get a lot of uh, interest, uh, a lot of applause from people. At the end of the 19th century, one of the strangest chapters of local history was written when Cyrus Teed led his cult of self-proclaimed visionaries to the banks of the Estero River to examine the world from the inside out. Today, Koreshian State Historic Site allows visitors to peek in on this unusual settlement. Probably the most unusual aspect of the Koreshian belief was they believed that we lived inside the earth. They felt that the earth was like a giant cell. Um, the land and seas were on the inside surface. The sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars were on the center in a big ball of gas. Cyrus Teed adopted the name Koresh, the Hebrew translation of his own name, and had his followers believing he was the seventh messiah. Koresh and Unity was a scholarly society that people today can witness in the park's 11 restored buildings. They brought the first symphony orchestra to Florida. They did concerts, plays, Shakespeare, and some of their own works. In addition to guided or self-guided tours, the state park offers everything from canoeing, fishing, nature watching, and camping to botanical tours and other special seasonal programs. In the master plan for the city that Koresh had envisioned is going to be 34 square miles and everything was going to be basically garden setting. They brought in plants and trees, bushes, everything from all over the world. During the winter season, park volunteers teach campers and day visitors about Dutch oven and cast iron skillet campfire cooking. Demonstrators also start up the 1920s generator that once powered the settlement. We begin by telling how old the building is. That building is 100 years old and uh, how sturdy it is and how it's uh, been there since 1908. And uh, then we go into the uh, ex explanation of the generator alternator system and how it works. And then we explain all of the uh, apparatus that are used to start the diesel engine. And then we start the diesel engine up for them. Aside from the occasional purr of the Fairbanks Morse engine, Koreshin radiates an air of almost eerie quiet and the mystery of a settlement that lasted less than 15 years. But on Yusepa Island, history comes in multiple layers over many millennia, from the island's ancient Calusa archaeological finds to its training site for Cuban Bay of Pigs operatives. The Barbara Sumwalt Museum takes visitors through the intriguing eras. You get 10,000 years of history on a 20-minute audio tour. Because Yusefa is accessible only by boat to members of its private club, people usually begin their day visit with a boat excursion through Captiva Cruises, the only day concession sanctioned by the club. Yusefa has a fascinating history. Archaeologists can document the inhabitation of man back over 10,000 years on Yusefa Island which would make it one of the oldest continuously inhabited sites in North America. The five-hour excursion gives guests on board background about local islands. Then time for lunch in the historic Collier Inn, a visit to the museum, and a stroll around the 100-acre islands intriguing past and present. I know there's a lot of testosterone in the history of Yusefa, but there's also a very strong feminine spirit. 10,000 years of people coming and going, not just Calusa, but the people before the Calusa, the people after the Calusa, Spanish fishermen, Civil War, um, Yankees kicked off the mainland, um, sports fishermen in the 1900s. Gone fishing. Isaac Walton Club was started by Baron Collier. He purchased the island in 1911. Um, it was one of the most prestigious fishing clubs in the United States or in the world at that time. They had fishing tournaments and the premise behind the club was that they would release all the tarpons that were not used for weigh-in. They had a room with tarpon scales that lined the room and on the scales itself they would have the weight of the tarpon, the person that caught the tarpon and the date of the tarpon. Guests can see some of the scales at the tarpon bar. Those who wish to revel in the absolute isolation of Yusefa Island have options for extending their trip beyond Captiva Cruises day voyage. We do have a Get Acquainted program. We also have a new summertime introductory membership where people can come out and pay um, a nominal fee to use the club for the three months that were very quiet. It's a great place to come and get away. Um, it's a great place to turn off your cell phone and put the tie, you know, keep the tie in the closet. 
uh, at home and come out and just bring your swimsuits and your Crocs and uh, just come out and get some R&R. &R. place lends itself very well to loafing. That very element of seclusion, local historians say, is what attracted Cuban anti-Castro subversives to the island in the 1960s. May of 1960, the CIA leased Yusefa and they brought in 66 uh, Cubans that were going to be trained um, to lead the invasion over in Cuba. It was not a successful invasion. They had 66 of the people here, 16 of them were caught and imprisoned. Similarly, off the typical tourist radar, Solomon's Castle near Arcadia is a quirky monument to one man's imagination and recycling artistry. Howard Solomon's creation continually grows to astound pilgrims to this bizarre attraction. The strange history here is the very materials used to create it. The castle is a standard two by six framing, but I've covered it with newspaper plates from our local newspaper. Inside, Howard's sculptures and paintings cram rooms with the ingenious to the wacky. Well, the steam engine took over, over a year to collect the parts for it. This is a valve out of a trumpet and a lampshade. That's a 1910 Ford kerosene lantern. This is a transformer canister like I see up on the power poles. That's from a Xerox machine with a shock absorber from a car. The engineer is made out of mattress ticking and clay. After only a few minutes with Howard, it becomes apparent that he and his offbeat humor are part of the main attraction. It shows in his work. These are my redneck neighbors. That's Abe Lincoln the day that he fired his tailor. This is called Where's Waldo for Dummies. Michael Jordan dancing with the Spice Girls and his Fruit of the Looms. The Morton Salt Girl. The Red Hat Lady. Howard grew up in the Depression era as part of a junk dealing family next to a train station in Rochester, New York. A comedian cut up who got kicked out of high school for his hijinks. Despite it all, today he is king of his castle. It's good to be king. Well, my friends call me Kingy. And, and uh, it doesn't go very far as, as far as my immediate family. Solomon's Castle opened in 1972. Since then, Howard has continually added on. It started with the ditch he built around the property, a moat, as he later decided, to provide the elevation for his castle. A moat needs a boat. And uh, 1990, I started building the boat. It took me four years, and it's a restaurant. My daughter runs it. But most recently, I've been working on a reproduction of the Alamo. So I decided, well, I'll, I'll build an Alamo east and with parking, and uh, I call it the Alishmo East. Now in his 70s, Howard relegates tours to staff and family. Visitors typically find Howard working in his shop. Should they decide to spend the night at this easygoing, family-operated spot that defies description, Howard's daughter runs a B&B &B on site. At the end of the day, it's one of Southwest Florida's most unique attractions for snooping into closets filled with bygone secrets. From mystical Indian mounds and a whole new way of looking at the world to secret revolutionary missions in a king's castle, these Southwest Florida attractions inevitably catch visitors by surprise. Yeah.